part two of my lecture is about the Renaissance in England. Now this was made possible by figures like Sir Thomas More and Henry VIII and also by the Reformation, a series of events by which the Church of England broke away from the authority of the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church. And this was of course part of the wider process of the European Protestant Reformation fueled by figures like Luther and Calvin. In 1534 we have an act of supremacy where England decides the monarch and not the Pope will settle religious disputes. And Protestantism actually becomes the religion of England under Edward VI, who is Henry VIII's son, uh, and the Archbishop Thomas Cranmer. You remember that Henry VIII broke away from the Catholic Church because they wouldn't grant him a divorce from Catherine of Aragon, his first wife, uh, so that he could marry Anne Boleyn. This is Henry VIII. And this is Sir Thomas More. Sir Thomas More, good friend of Erasmus and other intellectuals, uh, was a politician but also a thinker and a man of principle who was in fact beheaded because he wouldn't agree uh, to Henry breaking off from the church. He writes the wonderful fantasy Utopia where he satirizes contemporary political events and the speaker is a man called Raphael Hithlode who is both angel and peddler of nonsense. The word Hitlode in Greek is peddler of nonsense and Raphael is of course the name of an angel which talks about this wonderful place where you know the only way in which people compete is with their gardens and they don't pursue money, they pursue learning. So that's uh, Thomas More who gave his life for his principle. The most important monarch in the Renaissance in England was of course Elizabeth I, her dates are 1533 to 1603 and she reigned for a whopping 45 years, 1558 to 1603, whereas her brother Edward VI only reigned for six years and her half-sister the Roman Catholic Mary I for five years. These three are all children of Henry VIII. Now what are her achievements? Her achievements most of all is that she had stability in her reign and she did this by entertaining marriage proposals from European superpowers like France and uh, Spain but never giving in to them because she knew that if she married a Roman Catholic prince her people would be up in arms. Uh, she also listened to Parliament. She had a core group of trusted advisors including William Cecil, Lord Burley and Francis Walsingham who became Philip Sidney's father-in-law, she listened to these people. She didn't just act in an arbitrary manner as her, uh, as her, uh, her father Henry VIII was wont to. So even though she's in a difficult position, she's a woman, she is considered illegitimate because she's the daughter of Anne Boleyn by many and yet she manages to reign peacefully for 45 years. Uh, there's something called the Elizabethan settlement. Now, this is political rather than religious. She learns from her brother and her sister's mistakes and does not persecute religious minorities. Even though she is a Protestant, she doesn't for the most part persecute Roman Catholics. Yes, there are you know, famous Roman Catholics like the Jesuit Edmund Cantian who is put to death, but for the most part she is more tolerant as far as religion goes than her brother or her sister. Uh, she aids nationalism, she builds up a huge navy because she knows that Britain can't afford a large army and that navy is the reason for the huge defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588 which really makes her stock skyrocket. You know, she becomes a force to be reckoned with after defeating the so-called indefatigable Spanish Armada. Uh, she has people like Drake and Raleigh and company loot the Spanish ships. She just turns a blind eye because they're bringing gold and silver into the country. She, from the point of literature, she also initiates something what we now call the cult of Elizabeth and this takes place of the cult of the Virgin Mary. So you have the Protestants, they no longer have any saints or any idols that they, they can worship. Elizabeth presents to them a secular icon, a secular idol which is herself. And she encourages what I call a courtierly ethic, not a courtly ethic, a courtierly one. In other words, she encourages her courtiers to woo her as a Petrarchan lover would woo uh, somebody like Laura. All right? uh, as uh, Sir Walter Raleigh puts it, she hunts like Diana, 
but she walks like Venus. So she is a combination of desirability and chastity. She is the virgin queen, but she is also this person who is wooed by all her male courtiers. So why do we have all these sonnets written in the Elizabethan age? Love is not just love, as Arthur Marotti puts it. Love becomes a sort of industry. Writing sonnets becomes a sort of self-presentation, a way of putting your, yourself out there, all right? a way of talking about yourself. And it also, she also knows that the English people are susceptible to ritual. And she also unleashes a lot of patronage for, for, for courtiers and for poets and others. Uh, so that she shows, she's not just punitive, she's not just punishing people who don't obey her. She is showing through patronage that it is profitable to obey the queen. She is the first English monarch who's very, very particular about her own portraits. She doesn't allow any false portraits to circulate in the land. She makes a sitting, the Darnley portrait as this is called. Uh, she's always heavily dressed and bejeweled in all her portraits. Darnley was probably one of the older owners of this portrait. This is one of the few portraits that was painted from life, most probably painted from life. All right, so she disseminates these portraits and she makes sure that uh, images that she approves of circulate, images of herself that she approves of circulate in the land. Protestant League. Now the Protestant League is a band of radical Protestants including both Sydney and Spencer by the way and their leader is the Earl of Leicester. They're called the Leicester Faction. And Robert Dudley, the Earl of Leicester, who is actually Elizabeth's childhood sweetheart and for a long time people thought that she would marry him but then his first wife, Amy Robsart, suddenly fell down the stairs and broke her neck and of course people said, you know, he must have done away with her so that he could marry the Queen. Elizabeth immediately cooled relations with Leicester as a result of that incident. Uh, so this is a radical Protestant who feels that England should follow an interventionist policy in Europe. It should come all out in the support of other Protestant nations like the Netherlands, for example. But Elizabeth was far too wise. She didn't want to follow an interventionist policy because if she did so, the guns of France and Spain would be aimed at England and she wouldn't be able to defeat them. This is a portrait of the Earl of Leicester, who was a thoroughly bad on by all, all accounts, a completely disgusting person, uh, and Sidney's maternal uncle, all right, Sir Philip Sidney, 1554 to 1586. Now, when we read Astrophil and Stella, when we read the Arcadia, when we read an apology for poetry, we think, well, you know, this is one of the major poets in the English language. But you have to remember that Sidney didn't want to be a poet. He wanted to be a politician and he failed at being a politician because he was far too outspoken. He wanted to tell the queen how she should conduct herself and she didn't like this at all and she exiled him. So his works are very often written in these periods of so-called exile. All right. So remember that the poet that we read is actually a person who wanted to be a courtier and a Politician. So he's Leicester's nephew. He's an active member of the Protestant League. Uh, dies at the age of 32 in a completely pointless battle. Rushes out without wearing the requisite piece of armor. Is shot and then dies as a as a result of his uh, wounds. His apology for poetry comes out in 1595. Uh, this is a very major work. Uh, why? Because it is the first English expression on poetics and it situates the English poet in the classical poetics tradition. Before this you had people like Plato and Aristotle writing about poetry. All right, Now you have an Englishman who is referring back to that classical heritage but saying something completely new. What is this new thing that he is saying? First of all he is saying that the poet is superior to the historian and to the philosopher. The philosopher preaches, the philosopher tells us, go and do this, this is good for you. The historian confuses us because he tells us events in which the good are punished and the evil are rewarded. But the poet, by telling us wonderful tales, 
inspires us and moves us. See, the poet doesn't tell us what is the right thing to do. He just gives us a narrative, he or she just gives us a narrative and shows us that this is what happens, all right? So the poet inspires and moves us, whereas the philosopher and the historian may leave us cold. So the poet enables a man, a human being, to lead a virtuous life. Nos a praxis, not gnosis, must be the fruit. It's not enough just to have knowledge, you must also, it must also result in good action, praxis. Uh, he also says that the poets create a golden world. They create an ideal world. Nature's world is brazen. Also, he counters that, you know, that, that charge that Plato had made against poets about poets lying head on. What does he say? Now for the poet, he nothing affirms and therefore never lies. How, he says, can you call the poet a liar? He is never claimed to be speaking the truth anyway. So this is an important statement made on the rival worlds of actuality or reality and the world of fiction. All right? The world of fiction is not made up of lies. It is a fictional world. Fiction is different from uh, a lack of truth or an absence of truth. He also criticizes England for being so hard a stepmother to poets. All right, so you have to remember at the time when Sidney and Spencer are writing, all right, this is the infancy of English literature, of vernacular literature in England. And these are the two figures who make it possible. Uh, this is a portrait of uh, Sir Philip Sidney. Edmund Spencer, 1554 to 1599. Now, it's funny when you think that this is the man who wrote a major English epic, The Fairy Queen. This is a man who actually for a while toyed with the idea of never writing poetry. He wanted to be a politician. He was employed by the Earl of Leicester and he writes letters to his friend Gabriel Harvey saying, look, I think the time is right. Let me strike when the iron is hot because you never know when nobles may you know, lose their favor towards you. And sure enough, the Earl of Leicester, he did fall out of favor with the Earl of Leicester because he wrote a satire called Mother Hubbard's Tale in which, like Sidney, he came out too candidly and too, uh, in too outspoken a fashion against the Queen and against Lord Burley, her counselor, more Lord Burley than the Queen, and too openly in favor of Leicester. Uh, Leicester and Burley uh, belonged to opposing factions in the Elizabethan court, and uh, as a result of which he was packed off to Ireland. Uh, now, what Spencer does is his poetics is different from Sydney. Sydney believes in imitating classical literature. Spencer believes in imitating the English poets who have written before him. So Spencer's hero is Chaucer. Yes, he borrows a lot from Ovid, but his actual hero is Chaucer, whom he calls Titterus. And in his major initial work, The Shepherd's Calendar, which came out in 1579 and presented himself to the English-speaking world as uh, the new poet, he talks about going back to the sacred well of English, undefiled, undefiled by foreign borrowings. No Latinisms, no words from the Greek, let's use English. So he builds a supple new English language by borrowing, like Castiglione, words from all over England, from Northern England, from Southern England, from Wales, from Ireland, all right? So he is creating a new language for poetry, which wasn't there before. Uh, and he innovates, as Colin Burrow puts it, by using the old, create something new by using the old. His hero, remember, is an English hero, Arthur, all right? He doesn't talk about uh, Cyrus, he doesn't talk about Aeneas, he talks about Arthur, a homegrown English hero. In his letter to Raleigh, which is prefixed to the Fairy Queen, it was written after the first three books were completed, he too situates himself in the poetics tradition, as does Sidney in an apology to poetry. And he too talks about the importance of poetry being used to fashion a gentleman. Remember Pico's words about fashioning, about having the freedom of fashioning oneself? Remember Spencer was a scholarship student. He was not a man born to nobility. He came from very a very humble background, but he rose to uh, occupy 
uh, 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 you know, a good position as a result of his talent and his education. So this is an age, the Elizabethan age, in which we see rapid upward mobility. People like Spencer can actually rise, can actually make a name for themselves without being noble born. So that important of fashioning. Um, and he also critiques the court, you know. Uh, he, the fairy queen ends with these lines. He tells his verses, uh, seek to please that now is counted wise man's treasure. Now wisdom is equated with pleasure. So you, my verses, please rather than instruct, okay? Now Spencer, as a result of writing the fairy queen, which is dedicated to Queen Elizabeth, is called, for example, by Marx as England's ass kissing poet, but he wasn't this. He was a severe critic of the Elizabethan age. He didn't believe that, you know, the kind of uh, uh, double speak that was going on in the Elizabethan age was, was valuable or laudable. He was increasingly disenchanted with the court. And this finds expression in his satire, Mother Hubbard's Tale, uh, where he says, so pitiful a thing is suitor's state, most miserable man, whom wicked fate hath brought to court, to sue for, had he wist, to speed today, to be put back tomorrow, to feed on hope, to pine with fear and sorrow, to fawn, to crouch, to wait, to ride, to run, to spend, to give, to want, to be undone. Okay, very eloquent words talking about how demeaning it is to become a courtier at court, to know your own work and constantly have it diminished by people of, of lesser value just because they happen to be high born and members of, of court, of the court. Uh, this is a portrait of Edmund Spencer. We don't really know about its authenticity, but there are a number of images that we have of Spencer, but we can't really say for sure that uh, whether these are authorized. No lecture on the Renaissance would be complete without a word about women in the Renaissance. Now, unfortunately, despite exceptions like England's Queen Elizabeth I or uh, Italy's Elisabetta Gonzaga, the Duchess of Urbino, uh, the portrait of whom is somewhat idealized by Castiglione in his The Courtier. Uh, women in general suffered a great deal of oppression in the Renaissance. Patriarchy dominated women's sexuality. Chastity was a norm that was imposed on them. Women's economic, political and cultural roles were limited. And not just the average woman, even educated and exceptional women were taught to subordinate their own desires, their own ambitions to the needs of the men or of the family. If we take, for example, uh, the instance of Margaret Roper, who was the daughter and the favorite child of Sir Thomas More, even though he kept a special tutor for Margaret and made sure, you know, she was reading by the age of three and made sure that she was highly educated. She wrote beautiful letters to her father when he was imprisoned. Still in those letters, there is a clear demarcation of gender roles on the part of her father. He does not feel that Margaret's vocation is to be a scholar. Rather, it is to be an obedient daughter and a caring wife. So now I come to the end of my lecture on the Renaissance, the conclusion. Uh, as I've said, there, this was an age of tremendous achievements in the arts and in literature. Literature was written not only in Greek and Latin, but also in the vernacular. In the arts, we have the discovery of perspective. We have the sense of the substance of the human body finding expression. We have psychological interiority and we have the very important mix of the secular and the religious. Uh, this was an age of enormous hope, of confidence in human potential as expressed in Pico's oration on the dignity of man. But at the same time, it was an age of tremendous skepticism. As the poet John Donne writes, new philosophy calls all in doubt. You see the rise of Protestantism 
challenged the tenets of Roman Catholicism, which had so far been held dear. The, uh, the Copernican Revolution brought about, again, challenged beliefs in, you know, God creating the universe. Yeah, it was maths and science that was creating the universe and not this omnipresent being. And also the, the stress and strain of politics in the Renaissance also, you know, as we saw from that quotation from Spencer, uh, diminished uh, human beings' hope and faith in themselves and in existence. So there was a challenge to accepted beliefs in this period, a belief in the universe, a belief in religion, a belief in human beings' position in the world. I mean, Pico's chame chameleon, are we the center of the universe or do we figure nowhere in the universe? And that word chameleon expresses the contingent nature of human beings. Okay, uh, but human nature is not fixed, it is contingent. So while this can be a source of tremendous hope, you know, we can rise to the level of angels, it can also be a source of tremendous anxiety. Any day we may sink to the level of beasts. So these are some of the complexities of this age, this very rich age, uh, uh, rich in culture uh, that we call the Renaissance. Thank you.